Gentlemen, the 13th annual Tech Trends debate will now begin. Please welcome Churchill Club Chair of the Board, Steve Bankson. Good evening. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Churchill Club's 13th annual Top 10 Trex de Debate. I'm Steve Bankston, Director of Emerging Company Services at PwC, and I'm proud to be the chair of the Churchill Club this year. I'd like to say hello to all of our Fora TV viewers. For the audience, since Fora is live streaming this event, we'd appreciate it if you will get the word out to your followers on Twitter, Facebook, and other services. The web address is fora.tv. Now I'd like to welcome our panelists. Steve Jervison of Draper Fisher Jervison. One of Steve's hobbies and passions is building rockets. He's built over 20 of them so far, and each one gets progressively bigger. In, in fact, his children fit into them now, <laughs> although the children are still small. S uh, Steve collects Apollo artifacts, things like rocket engines. He's an avid photographer and has taken over 20,000 photos of rockets launching. Please welcome Steve Jervinson. And he's got his briefing papers right here. Uh, Jay Royan of Clarium Capital. At age 11, 11, uh, Jay wrote to a British automaker proposing a manufacturing partner to suit the rugged Middle Eastern markets. He considers it his first entrepreneurial failure. His childhood obsession included Legos, circuit boards, and factory machinery. Typical kid things. He came to America as a teenager and fell in love with the American frontier. Please welcome Ajay Royan. <laughs> Paul Sappho of Discern Analytics. Paul's a, mid, a wilderness EMT and seems to attract rattlesnakes, so careful where you walk tonight. He's what may be the world's most complete co collection of nuclear bomb damaged calculators. He built his first blue box at 16 and had his phone tapped for the first time by Ma Bell in his freshman year at Harvard. Please welcome Paul Sappho. <laughs> Anish Chopra, first CTO of the United States. Anish's favorite tech item is his iPad. He's a big Sorry. fan of Taco Bell and he loves spending time with his daughters. Anish is on his way here from another engagement and will join us shortly. And welcome and thank you for all being here. Now let's get our moderator to the stage. Coming back yet for a 13th time to the program, we have the famous or possibly infamous Tony Perkins. <laughs> Tony's founder and editor-in-chief of Always On and co-founder of the Churchill Club. His favorite past Churchill Club program was with Chief Buddha Lazy head of the Zulu tribe in Africa. Tony's known for having conservative political views, so you might be surprised that he does yoga every day, looking sharp now, <laughs> drinks kombucha, wears Birkenstocks to work and apparently to moderate panels, and drives a Prius. Please welcome our Master of Ceremonies, Tony Perkins. All right. Uh, good to be here. Uh, I want to really not forget something really important, and I want to just give a heartfelt love and appreciation to Karen Tucker and Jenny Bowman, who are the force behind the Churchill Club. And as you can imagine, for we've kept the organization alive for 25 years, and it has nothing to do with people like myself. And I just thought you guys treated uh, all of us so well in getting us here and preparing us. And so, Jenny and Karen, let's all hear it for Jenny and Karen. All right. and, it, and it's true. I mean, the better they do, the better I look. Um, of course, I love momentous occasions, uh, but you know, one of the weird parts of being the founder of the club is every time we hit a new milestone, 
everybody looks at me and goes, oh, he's really getting old. Um, so I'd just like to remind people that I was 14 and Rich Carlgaard was 16 when we started the club. <laughs> so that means I hit number two when I was doing my demographic, uh, which makes me 39. And next year I'll, be thir I'll have been 13 when I started the club. Uh, so I don't know how long I'm going to be able to get away with it. But, it, you know, I could have started the club at 14, right? Um, anyway, uh, before we bring up our sacrificial lamb, uh, who's going to be presenting his, uh, uh, Steve is already laughing because he's the only one that's been here before. Um, Steve, I think both of us can see that we're getting old because we couldn't remember how many, I, I know how many times I've been here, 13, but you couldn't remember. So, so your disc drive is getting full. Um, I, I like to, uh, oh, I want to mention that Steve's father is here, Tony Gerbenson, and uh, we, 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 lo we love family. My brother's here, Michael Perkins. Uh, Steve, I, always, I think for every year that you've been here, however many years that has, I've always said that you're the fastest talking person on the planet. Uh, so I'm not going to say that this year. I'm just going to allow you to demonstrate that. Um, I also understand, Steve, that th it was your idea, because normally we would have these fine gentlemen give their trends, right? And, and it might have been your idea that we shove that responsibility off to one person because if you haven't been here before, this is kind of like a roast. And so when each person gets to uh, pr presents their event, you know, their trend and everybody else would pile on them and uh, obviously you got sick of being piled on. So you sh Much we now have one on presenter, the mild manner Kurt Carlson who will come up here in a second. Um, Paul, uh, I'm going to skip uh, OJ for a second because I've just met him tonight. Paul I've known for 25 years probably. We were in kindergarten together. So. We were in kindergarten. <laughs> when Tony, uh, when, when you had the idea? When I had the idea for the Churchill Club. You encouraged me. 39. All the way through sixth grade and I finally did it. Um, but Paul, you know, we, one of the times that we always used to get together was at the World Economic Forum and <clears throat> I have to tell you Paul, uh, there was that one time when we were at this like dinner with all these famous international dignitaries and, and Joe Schorndorf who used to sit on this panel. You mean Saturday night? Yeah, Saturday night. That was my dinner. That was your dinner. Okay, yeah. it was your dinner. So no wonder. Okay, then the they story's going to make a little more sense. So we're at the dinner and Joe Schorndorf, this is like in 90 or 2002 or something, and Joe Schorndorf is introducing me and he's telling uh, everybody like, hey, you know, this guy and his brother Michael, they wrote the internet bubble and they were so right about it and, and they foretold it was going to pop and all that kind of stuff. In fact, many people uh, said that uh, they were responsible for the popping of the bubble, at which time Paul uh, jumped in and said, yeah, that's why we call Tony and Silicon Valley the prick. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you, Paul. So not true. <laughs> uh, it's going to be a long night. Yes. Uh, now, Ajay, you're, uh, you're Peter Thiel's uh, partner. Peter Thiel, of course, is a famous guy who started PayPal. He was on the board. He gave Mark Zuckerberg the first half a million bucks. What's well, interesting to note uh, that Peter Thiel used to be an intern for me uh, at Upside Magazine, that Rich Carl guy and I started when we were starting the Churchill Club. And so the last time I saw Peter, I, I think I was saying something like, don't forget to take out the trash after you turn out the lights. Um, <laughs> so I haven't seen him since then. So when you see him, give him my love. I shall. He's obviously uh, done well and can buy and sell me more than a couple times. But we. I uh, appreciate you uh, being here tonight. Thank uh, you. Pleasure to be here. So, on to our good friend who spent a lot of time uh, putting together what I believe is an incredible list of trends. Our trend presenter is Kurt Carlson. If you'd like to join us, Kurt, let's welcome him, who's the <laughs> CEO of SR International. Uh, Kurt became a professional violinist at the age of 15. 
So um, one year after I started the Churchill Club, uh, playing with the Rhode Island Philharmonic Orchestra. He began his technology-related career as a researcher at RCA Labs, which later became Sarnoff, an SRI subsidiary. A project that Kurt is especially proud of is his role at starting and helping lead the HD TV program that became the U.S. standard, for which his team won an Emmy Award. That's amazing. So uh, again, let's please uh, welcome <laughs> Kurt. He seems so uh, gentle and unassuming. <laughs> Um, so here's what happens. Kurt will present the trends, the panel will vote, discuss, and then the audience will vote and we'll see where we end up, okay? Uh, voting, uh, here's how it's done. Uh, after each trend is presented by Kurt, then uh, each of our panel will raise a paddle, right? And it'll, if it's red, that means they disagree with his trend. And if it's green, that means they agree with this trend. And if they kind of wobble it around, they're kind of saying, I'm not totally on board, but I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Uh, and then after we've heard their discussion, uh, then we'll ask each of you to just raise we're, we, the low tech part, uh, which is to raise your either red card if you don't like the trend or your green card. Uh, and then I'll wave back and forth like this and say kumbaya, no. Uh, and we'll get a kind of a visual, but then you will also uh, vote as will be instructed by the screen uh, on to what degree you either agree or disagree with the, uh, with the, with the trend on your little electronic device. So, so we're Tony, since Anish isn't here, can I vote his turn? <laughs> You're always trying to get away with something, Paul. <laughs> Uh, but sure. Thank you. Um, so that's it. So uh, let uh, our distinguished um, forecaster, Kurt, want to present the first trend? Please. Great. Well, thank you, Tony, and thank you, Karen and Jenny and um, Steve for inviting us here. Only in Silicon Valley would you get a bunch of techies together and have a roast. Can you imagine this? I mean, does this make any sense at all? Anyway, we're going to do that, and I hope we can be a little provocative. Um, first, I'd like to say how um, pleased we are to have um, you all here and have SRI be part of this great event. Um, as many of you know, SRI um, technology and innovation is what we think about and do every day, and it's what we've been thinking about and doing since our founding almost uh, 65 years ago. Tonight, we're going to offer 10 technology trends, trends that are hopefully provocative, plausible, and certainly debatable. We're not necessarily advocating these trends as such. We'll leave the yay and nay to our great esteemed panelists and to you folks in the audience. Rather, what we, they are what we see as possible and what we see on the horizon as disciplines combine, technologies converge, and user needs change. Our goal is to stimulate your thinking, stretch your imagination, and of course, being the Churchill Club, we hope to have a lot of fun as well. So here's the first trend. Technology is designed for and disproportionately used by the young. But the young are getting fewer. The big market will be older people. The aging generation has grown up with and is comfortable with most technology, but not with today's latest technology products. Technology product designers will discover the baby boomer's technology comfort zone and will leverage it in the design of new devices. One example today is the Jitterbug cell phone with a large keypad for easy dialing and powerful speakers for clear sound. The trend is for baby boomers to dictate the technology products of the future. Wow, it's kind of an anti-trend. <laughs> Paddles, please. Blue Jay? Wow. Oh, a little gonna, bit of a green. Okay, maybe. so maybe. Steve, start talking sure. fast. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I, uh, I, I want to vote green because I suspected that people would start with going for blood and I wanted to, you know, toss a bone to Carl. It, he overstates it, but that's what futurists do. And turning to a famous one to my left, they overstate the near term 
and understate the long term. So I believe this is an important long term trend. By no means over the next three years will product design be dictated by the old. So as stated, it's wrong. But the reason I think it's important and I gave it a green is the, in the early signs that this is an important market and the sort of call to action entrepreneurs I think is an important one because the market is enormous, right? For a sense of where America, for example, is heading, think about Florida today. Before the year 2025, all of America will look like Florida does today demographically, right? Think about all those folks that retire there, right? That's gonna be America in general, and it's even worse in other parts of the world. In America, they have $2 trillion of purchasing power. Two trillion, the largest group of buyers in the nation. Very few products and services are aimed at them, right? In aggregate, there's about 515 billion spent on healthy aging. It's an enormous market, but very few people are focusing on this market. Very few entrepreneurs, perhaps because they're young, perhaps because they don't yet have empathy for this cohort, aren't focusing on their needs. They're focusing on products they would want to use. And so while the jitterbug is interesting, there aren't many of them. And the jitterbug, frankly, isn't selling that well compared to Android or you know, iPhones, right, in terms of uptake. In fact, that, that company had to recently come out with other products aimed at the young. So I think it is a um, market that hasn't been penetrated well. The products and services aren't quite there yet for the people. The market, though, is enormous. And so it's this sort of So are you, are you going to go out and bet on some of these yeah. jitterbugs? No, not, well, we've spoken with a bunch of companies like that. We don't have an investment specifically in a jitterbug-like company, but... So you see yeah. momentum in new business plans in this world? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, there's a boomer summit that focuses on this. There's a bunch of folks who are realizing, in fact, there's large organizations that think we should have venture funds that do nothing but pursue this trend um, as a major investment theme. Okay, so, now to our naysayers. Yep. Uh, Ajay? Well, uh, I do think the trend is uh, accurate in the sense that demographically it's undeniable. It's a fact of life. Steve correctly points this out. The issue is very simply, I think good design is universal. Beauty is uh, before age. The design principle applies across ages. And good design speaks to all of us at the human level. So if you look at some very, very successful products over the last you know, half decade or even decade, let's, let's talk about ones that we're all familiar with. There's a bunch of them in the room, I'm sure now. iPhones, iPads, um, the Nintendo Wii, um, you know, Facebook. These are things where you have grandmothers and grandchildren both using the product very effectively and really getting almost uh, the maximum functionality out of it in many cases and discovering new functionality as they go along. So these are very sophisticated platforms, great technology, but delivered with a design language that is universally accessible. So I do think you have to be aware of the demographic, uh, but I think you have to be more aware of great design and just, you know, make it speak to everyone. So SRI hit a large nail not quite on the head. Um, this is a growing market, but I can guarantee you that as boomers move into geezerdom, they are going to be about as excited by buying phones with big buttons as little kids are about training diapers. Uh, that, you know, we've tried or, or selling... Or maybe it's the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, don't the, clap, it could be you. <laughs> You don't, you don't sell products specifically to aging boomers. Uh, it's, that's just not the market. Ajay put it right. The right term here is universal design, is you design products that can mass customize and adjust to many markets. Uh, and it's already started. It started with the ADA passage in 1990. You know, we put ramps on the curves of our streets, because this isn't just about aging boomers. This is about people with disabilities. It's why the shape of our door handles have changed in the last 20 years. A good example of a design that's here today that's already been a success, and it's a good pointer, is the Amazon Kindle, which, you know, you think about geek yeah. boys using it. It took off in southern Florida early on. That was one of the places where it really took off like a rocket, and everybody was going, what the hell is going on? Well, it turned out that retirees in southern Florida, little old ladies, spend their time sitting around reading bodice rippers and mystery novels. And they have to go down and buy a new paperback every two days. And with the Kindle, they didn't have to go down and buy the paperback, and best of all, the typeface changed. That's what universal design does. You don't address the boomer market by addressing boomers specifically. It's good design that customizes to them and allows them to pretend that they're still 50. Okay. <laughs> So it's time to lift up your red card or your green card. Okay, I have to say, Kurt, buddy, it's looking like you're getting a long night, Kurt. Run over by a sea of red. But let's go for the real test, the scientific test. 
Time to push those buttons. Um, again, if you super love Kurt like all his employees at that table, you will hit a 10. <laughs> <laughs> and to, uh, and to vote 10, the 10 key is in the bottom in the middle of your keypad. You just simply press that once. You do not press 1 and 0. You just press 10 on the bottom. We want to know the strengths of your agreement or the strengths of your disagreement. And we are almost there. Last chance on this. And here is the spread of the vote on the scale from 1 to 10. And the overall amount is a 44% level of agreement right there, that 4.4. And as you can see, we have a majority of us voting one through five. But we do have 16% of us giving it an eight, nine, and a 10. That's, that's pretty good. And this is how it looks being by underwater. the roles. So by roles, there's really no difference by roles except for managers and staff are saying as a group a little low average. That's that's it. All right, okay. on to trend number two. Oh, our, our up, boy bro? here, An Anish Hi, Chopra. Have a good night. Dude. <laughs> Have fun. What's up, everybody? Thank you, thank you. The Chief yeah. Technology Officer of the United States. We're playing ping pong? Is that what the yeah. 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 What a Funny hell of a job life. you have. Okay, Anish, because you're late, you have to come up with your biggest trend. <laughs> <laughs> On the spot. I, I believe... For my, uh, the one trend I would recommend that everyone pay attention to is the potential billion dollar opportunity that lies at the intersection of health care and the new care delivery systems that we're calling the accountable care organizations and IT. So I actually believe that there'll be a new marketplace for IT enabled services that will actually lower health care costs and improve quality because of all of the macro trends that will go live in 2012. Payment reform, uh, the digitization of our healthcare system, and the liberation of data from our, our uh, public posture, uh, our open government initiative. So I think for startups in the room, the hottest trend right now, the next big billion dollar opportunity, it sits at that intersection of healthcare, IT, and the new care delivery system. So bottom line, Obamacare is still alive. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not going to ask for a vote on that one. Okay, no, but welcome. And the smart should... investors in this room know what I'm talking about. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, good trend, good trend. Okay, Kurt, we're now, uh, you're lucky, we're now uh, on to number two, but um, Anish, your paddle is not to hit Paul next to you, but yes. to vote red or... Yes, or, sir. Okay, you know that. Okay, good. Take it away, Kurt. Okay. Some of our political leaders say that we have, quote, the best medical care system in the world. Think what it must be like in the rest of the world. <laughs> nice to have you back. <laughs> he has one quote. <laughs> there are many problems, but one is the high cost of delivering expert advice. With the development of practical virtual personal assistance, powered by artificial intelligence, and pervasive low-cost sensors, quote, the doctor will be in online, where people around the world, instead of the current web paradigm, quote, fill, in the, fill out this form and we'll show you information about what might be ailing you. This will be true diagnostics, supporting and in some cases replacing human medical practitioners. Today we're sending x-rays to India to be read. Now India is connecting to doctors here for diagnosis in India. We see the idea in websites that now offer online video conferencing interactions with the doctor. The next step is automation. The trend is toward complete automation, a combination of artificial intelligence, the internet, and very low cost medical devices and instrumentation to provide high quality diagnoses and advice including answering patient questions online to a worldwide audience. So you want to summarize that trend? It is, uh, I guess we have it up there. So uh, the trend is towards, okay, I guess you already said that. Uh, green or red? Green. Half and half, you're, you're cheating, is that what that is? What is that? No, I'm not cheating. Nice. Which way do we point? Okay, Paul, explain yourself. <laughs> um, uh, it's, again, it's, look, selling directly to consumers. This, some of this stuff's going to happen, but 
the real market for this, as described, is to the worried well and to health hobbyists. It's not a mass market. Uh, the technology is happy, happening. The key factor is sensors. Um, this isn't about people putting in data. It's about data on people's persons, putting data up into the system. And that can have a dramatic effect. Just the shift, think of blood pressure, going from discrete measurement twice a year when you see your doctor to blood pressure being taken every time you hold your iPhone and after you get off the phone with your teenager, it says, you know, you really should take a break. <laughs> um, so this stuff has huge effects, but in different areas. For doctors, it'll actually be a professional tool to help them avoid uh, misdiagnosis. For the last century, 20% of serious health cases have been misdiagnosed, and the number's been constant. Medicine is too complex for even doctors to understand. These are advisors to them. The second place, so you're going to see it in your doctor's office first. The second place you will see it is in the hands of the paraprofessionals, the EMTs and paramedics who attend to you in an emergency. We already have companies like um, uh, uh, Cygnostics that has a handheld ultrasound device. We're going to have technology advances that gives us handheld CTs and the like. And finally, for the rest of us, what it will slip into our lives is your, your health advisor will watch the sensor data from your smartphone and your intelligent toilet and everything else. And when you go to the icebox at 1130 at night and you reach for that slice of chocolate pie, the refrigerator is going to say, you know, that's bad for your blood glucose. And I'm not going to call your doctor because you're not afraid of him, but I'm going to call his nurse and she is going to be way ticked off at you. <laughs> as long as they don't call my wife, I'm cool. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Anish. Let me provide, I'll just say three things. Uh, number one, without taking a point of view, of course I did vote, but let me just say infrastructure-wise, the National Library of Medicine is actually enabling as, as much of this as it can. There's an apps contest right now. Any medical record system that produces a patient diagnosis code can spit back from Medline Plus, which is our kind of consumer-facing data of scientific literature about what is or is not the condition at hand. You can today get information out of the National Library of Medicine uh, through an API, and any entrepreneur in the room can build out an app. So you can actually start seedling, if you will, the ideas of, of this uh, medical assistant. But I get back to the original point I made. If the health healthcare delivery system is financially rewarded by keeping you healthy, imagine that you're a, a, a physician right now you look at the 30 patients that are in your practice who come to, who call you for an appointment, ask yourself, if I had 2,000 patients, are these the 30 I should be seeing tomorrow? If I was focused on making sure that the people who needed my attention got it without having to get back readmitted to the hospital and all the things that I've indicated are suggestions of where the, where the failure in the system is. If I'm financially incentivized to treat people, uh, to keep them healthier, that's the whole premise behind payment reform. That was what I sort of alluded to earlier. I believe a new market will rise to provide extended support for our primary care physicians that will al allow them to have a bit more uh, a triaging. I'll tell you a funny story and then I'll end. Grand Aids. You might say, what on earth is Grand Aids? The provost of UVA healthcare system is a physician, was the dean of the medical school and found out that a significant number of emergency room visits to their you know, level one trauma center were basic routine care. He's training grandma to go out and visit patients and their homes, carrying a laptop and a bit of a training support vehicle so that they can do the early triage. In a sense, the early version of what, what this capability is because it keeps people out of the higher cost setting. If our healthcare system actually financially rewards that kind of activity, which is why I think the case is to be made, there are innovations like this that will take hold. Uh, I, I think this is a, a, a viable prospect. Great. Does either of you have anything to add? Oh, God, yeah. Someone's got to speak up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think this trend is patently absurd. As worded, it is uh, preposterous. And not only is it wrong, it's dangerous because it might actually guide me to the complacency. There's not going to be any automation over the next three years, not a shred of it at the point of care. Sensors are nowhere near it. The data is very fuzzy. You're not going to do a blood draw by robots. You're not going to have someone look at a webcam photo and provide care or diagnostics, except at the fringe, as is already being done today. Home health care for diabetics with sensors, yes, they have that already. Nothing new there. There isn't anything new coming in the next three years. 
There are much bigger problems around payer incentives, around the FDA, around how EMRs are going to be rolled out and are they going to be compatible is really the key issue. So if you just say healthcare, big problem, technology will fix it, sure. And just blah, blah, blah in between. But if you look at this trend, I mean, it's just completely missed the point and has nothing to do with what we need to fix. So a big trend in their future led by Obama and others will be having point of care practitioners, not just doctors, but nurse practitioners and others, provide higher quality care by tapping into cloud applications. Hippocrates, Athena Health, a ton of companies are racing to provide all these services so that some person <coughs> can interact with the patient and provide better care than they do today. And yeah. that could be remote, that could be in villages around the world, that could allow specialists to reach people around the world, but there's gonna be a human at the interface. Yeah. Uh, Jay, yeah. absolutely agree with Steve, uh, and to an extent with Paul as well. I think uh, with two for two in red, I'm gonna start sounding like a Luddite here, but uh, the fact of the matter is, this is an industry where if you ask people in 1980, would people, would doctors be writing prescriptions by hand in 2010? Uh, that would be an absurd idea. They were expecting flying cars. We have neither. Um, and so uh, it, it's just a reality that there has been, you know, the, the technology exists. A lot of this technology has existed for a long time. Telemedicine technology has existed for a decade or more in a viable format of one kind or the other, but very limited implementation. At the human level, both at the level of the practitioner and uh, consumers of the healthcare system, bedside matter, you know, matters a great deal. You know, sort of uh, provider contact and the quality of that contact matters a great deal. So to Paul's point, sort of embedded systems of some kind, sort of man-machine symbiosis, uh, artificial intelligence enabling better decision making at various points of the system, and therefore a set of systemic incentives arising, absolutely possible, interesting, happening, but not quite as it's you know, sort of posited here that you're, you're gonna replace your doctor with AI and it's gonna be ubiquitous. Um, no, so strong red. All right, now time to lift your little red or green cards here. And, and then also oh vote, oh, wow. <laughs> vote up electronically. Okay, a few more moments on this. We're going to close the vote. And last chance, here are the results. And so again, uh, very much trending on the one through five range. And the overall value is a four. So this one's even lower overall than the last one. But we do have a same number. We have 13% uh, giving it an eight, nine, and a 10. Great. All right, Kurt, trend number three. By the way, one uh, anecdotal evidence here. <laughs> is this is if this is a literal replacement the trend is is obviously a no the question is it's moving in the direction so i want to make sure that my colleagues to the right he actually agreed that the trend in these areas is moving in that direction so i just want to i want to make sure i get the, the facts right. am i wrong all right i got to get my homework assignment correct okay yeah. and niche pretty soon we're going to sit you over at the sri table <laughs> It's just like an employee of the Fed who arrives yeah, late yeah, and late. violate the process. Yes. <laughs> Over budget. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Kurt. <laughs> so, we love so, you, brother. So Tony, Welcome to Silver Island. Tony, how do I stop myself from rebutting Paul? I mean, how is that possible? <laughs> I, t I told anyway. you it was going to be a sweaty night. <laughs> okay, we got the next one? Yep. Manufacturing is un undergoing a revolution. It is becoming technically and economically possible to create products that are unique to the specific needs of individuals. For example, a cell phone that has only the hardware you need to support the features you want, making it lighter, thinner, more efficient, cheaper, and easier to use. This level of customization is being made possible by converging technology advances. New 3D printing technology is well documented, and networked micro-robotics is following. 3D printing now includes applications in jewelry, industrial design, and dentistry. While all of us may not be good product designers, we have different needs and we know what we want. The trend is toward practical, one-off production of physical goods in widely distributed micro factories, the ultimate customization of products. Gentlemen, it's kind of the anti-Apple trend, right? <laughs> Not to prejudice you. Okay, we got Anish is sticking with his buddy. Um, okay, Anish. So this is another example where the 
Well, I'll go to the quoting of the President's Council of Advisors of Science and Technology. They've come back with a report on networking and information technology, and they're very clearly bullish on the prospects of advancements in robotics, uh, advancements in the use of modeling and simulation tools that allow for more rapid cycle times for product development. And in fact, we're seeing, in fact, we put a public-private partnership together with John Deere and GE and Procter and & Gamble and others to do a test case for how we could democratize access to these tools to small to medium-sized manufacturers, which is still the bulk workforce for the American manufacturing system. So again, literal interpretation, will this happen tomorrow? I think everybody would say none of these things happen immediately, but is the trend moving towards the ability for America's manufacturing strength to come back in part powered by the tools that allow them to do more custom delivery of, of product? Yes, that is in fact where we're going. We'll see more investments in this area in robotics R&D and the expansion of modeling and simulation tools. Can I happen to know? Yes. Uh, Please. Yes. So, I, I happen to sit on one of the National Academy's committees that, you know, there's this vast entity of committees in Washington that gives advice. I, I'm convinced actually in Washington, you know, it's the old saying, good Catholics, when they die, they go to heaven. In Washington, good bureaucrats, when they die, they go to a meeting about heaven. Um, <laughs> but, and I think this is an important trend. I do want to say in Kurt's defense, I love all of these 10 trends. The hitch here is the three-year time frame. So 3D printing is coming. However, um, we, you know, it will be the second term of the Malia Obama administration, and we will still be waiting for this to hit the general public. You know, it will still be a thing of the maker fair. 3D printing is moving fast in special needs situations, like the military in the field having basically a factory vat on a truck where they can manufacture a replacement part for a tank. And Kurt, I do agree that the specialty niche applications like uh, dental implants could happen fairly fast, but not within three years. You're gonna see 3D printing in the short term as an aid to design. Companies like Stratasys doing 3D modeling, they're already doing stuff for BMW, they help Apple and others. 3D printing is gonna have an effect on your life, but it's going to be a long time before you can do your own 3D printing unless you're the kind of geek that likes hanging out at Maker Faire. There you go. <laughs> can I? Yeah, go ahead, Steve. Yeah, I, I, I would agree Steve's. with that. He is um, that kind of geek. I'm that kind of geek, and, the, I and I've too. done this stuff, and I've done right. my own jewelry design and examples that are on here, and it's great for prototyping, being a geek, hacking things. But I think you might miss an important trend, which is personalizing of products, absolutely, but not the physical goods, right? It's just way too expensive to do one-off physical goods unless you have to. And the average person does not have 3D design skills. VRML and every 3D creation tool you've ever imagined has failed largely because the average person does not think in 3D, it cannot deal with the screen, the mouse interface, both of which are 2D. They can't render, we just don't have software tools for doing that. It's gonna take at least two years to solve that problem. But there is a great opportunity in personalization. So you think about everything that you love, your iPhone, your what have you, it's a vessel for personalization. Code, right, and services personalize. And that is a mega trend over the next three years. It's unfortunately missed here in the way this is worded. And that code is permeating outward, right? New cars will have the whole skin of the user interface configurable, no marginal cost, right? FPGAs and electronic circuits have software that's inside that allows them to be configurable, but you're not gonna design the physical thing that they go into, but the electronics are, are configurable. DNA is increasingly code, it is increasingly printable, it is written in labs, centralized labs in this case, and it, but it is very customizable, therapies that are customizable, solutions that are customizable. So code, everywhere you find it, is changing industries, not the things that are the vessels for code. Uh, Jay? Yeah. I, I, you know, this is a tough one for me, simply because it's, it's much like the previous assertion where at the individual consumer level, you were not gonna see one-to-one -one correspondence that if I order something very unique, I get it made unique just for me. But um, I think in its potential to change the economics of manufacturing in this country, it is an extremely important trend. I think we're already seeing it affect industries. Smaller companies are able to afford prototyping that you know, they, at their scale, they simply would not exist as independent companies in the previous era. And this is, it's beginning in sectors that have already been mentioned, medical devices, uh, sort of military applications which we look at and uh, sort, of national, sort of new defense, if you will, as a sector uh, where we're seeing tremendous prototyping advances happening because of this, helping you know, folks in the field. So that was sort of mainly driving my, my support of, of the trend. And I think it'll find its way to consumers uh, later than sooner. 
but can't be ignored. I actually have a couple of anecdotes to this. Uh, I remember going to Helsinki or wherever Nokia is headquartered. They have this beautiful building, and you walked in, and they had this whole wall of phones, you know, some with American flags, you know, all different kinds of colors and everything. And it was very overwhelming. And I remember the CEO of Nokia explained to me, well, we're just, you know, really niched out, and this is how we, you know, we create these for very targeted subgroups. And in the 90s, Nokia, you know, was the phone. Uh, and it was obviously working uh, for them. Uh, the other anecdote is I remember talking to Steve Jobs when he first took over Apple. The first thing he did, they had 85 models of their computers, and he just had somebody line them up. And he walked down the whole line. He goes, kill it, kill it, kill it, kill it. Uh, and if you think about it, Apple, maybe uh, to uh, Steve's point, you know, their individuality, their their industrial design is very simple choice. There's like three different of everything. But their personalization comes in the form of software. So anyway, uh, not to prejudice anybody, let's all hold up our cards for this one. This is a fun one. OK, and let's, uh, looks ominous for our boy. Uh, can, can, can we have the electronic version as well? This is beginning to look like a communist party. <laughs> <laughs> all the red. <laughs> All right, we're almost there. Fast <laughs> vote on this one. And here are the results. And so this one, again, right in the middle, 4.646% level of agreement. And again, we have the same 14% or so giving it an 8, 9, and a 10. All values of 1 to 10 get a vote. Those are the results. Great. Okay, on to a rosier trend. Trend number five. I think you missed four. Are we on four? Yep. No, you haven't done four. 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 We're, We're on, on four. four. Oh, okay. Not so rosy. Information. <laughs> Pay me now. Oh, I like that. Information about our personal behavior and characteristics is exploited regularly for commercial purposes, often returning little or no value to us, sometimes even without our knowledge. This knowledge is becoming a key asset and a major competitive advantage for the companies that gather it. Think of your supermarket club card. These knowledge gatherers will need to get smarter and more aggressive in convincing us to share our information with them and not their competitors. If TV advertisers know who the viewers are, the value of the commercials goes up enormously. The trend is technology and business models based on attracting consumers to share large amounts of information exclusively with service providers. All right, gentlemen. Okay, Paul. And Explain the smirk. Green went with green. 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 Okay. Right. I'm so. just writing it down. I'm calling that wimp when you do this. Okay. <laughs> okay. <who's laughs> okay. I'm gonna. Well, I'm sticking this way. I think yeah. it was. And again, I love these trends, but. This one was framed wrong. If it had been said, instead of pay me now, if the title was give me free, I'd say absolutely green. It's here already. Let me ask you a question. Uh, how many people here use Google? Show of hands. Um, and just shout out the answer. What was your Google subscription last month? <laughs> That'd be zero. Uh, well, actually, you all pay for Google. It's not free. You just don't realize you pay. You pay with the search string you put in, which gives them huge valuable information, and they give you the service back for free. We used to pay for search once upon a time. So it would be nice if they would pay us, but the bargaining power is too unequal. Uh, they'll never pay us what our information's worth, yes. but they'll make life so convenient that we won't notice. Here's a product forecast from Google. You all know that Google's been running robots in the wild on our highways. Uh, they've about 150,000 miles of robots dri being driven around the, the roads here. Everybody knows that. And you think, well, what's Google got to do with that? Are they going to sell robotic cars or telematics to manufacturers? Here's my, here's my bet. And they say it's a research product project, and it's mm -hmm. not a product. But you all know they got the Street View vehicles driving around already. They charge the, and they, they pay the drivers 15 bucks an hour to drive those cars. Imagine a car sharing service 
that is Google cars, robot, and that the robots drive them, uh, and uh, and you can you rent them like you rent city car or the like. Except they'll actually come to your house when you get picked up and dropped off. Um, but on the roof of the car, in addition to the um, sensors, will be the Street View camera. And basically, Google will give you a discount on driving that car in exchange for taking pictures while you go and sucking up the information about where you're no, going. No, it's Google. They'll just do it anyway and not pay you. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. They're not going to pay you, but they're not going to charge exactly you as much as do. they otherwise would. So it's, uh, this is uh, give it to me for free, not pay me now. Much Roger, as I, I wish it were. You, you had. I think, uh, I think Paul is dead on. I think the analogy for information utilities is banking, not investing. I think uh, the reason I'm not a fan of this trend happening is because we, as information consumers, think like banking clients. Let's go deposit our money in sort of large public utilities that are essentially banks. They will monetize it on behalf of their shareholders. It's totally different from investing your information and the information, sort of this enormous capital contained in that information and getting discernible returns to yourself. And as soon as that mind shift happens and people start seeing that perhaps three, five years, ten years from now, we might have this meeting again and talk about this trend and the affirmative, but we're not there yet. Any other quick thoughts? Well, yeah. I, I didn't hang up so much on the pay me now, but the trend as it was written, which is that there will be some way that they make money off personalization, which is nothing new, but is getting more and more powerful. So we, if we just relax for a second, the idea that does actually, does a check come to you, or do you, as the, per the spirit of the trend, get more and more value from personalization under the businesses orchestrated around it? Unbelievably so. It's not widely known, but, but Amazon makes more money off merchandising than product sales. Right? Think about yeah. gross margin of their products. They make more in merchandising stuff to you. You may not realize it. You go down the trees, you pick this, other people who pick this want to buy this. They're making money off referring products to you. They make more off of selling products and uh, off the services. For a sense of how pervasive this is, there's a company, Rich Relevance, who enables that for other retailers. And they process 25% of all e-commerce on Black Friday, for example. And what they realize is that in aggregate across all the different companies that are doing this to you right now, you can personalize, you get about a 15% uplift in sales and 8% uplift in profitability as a business. Just boom, just turning that on. So that's going to happen. Well, what's even more amazing is that when they're open and transparent to the consumer, it doubles. So within the range of benefit, if you say something like, you want this or buy this, you get a certain uplift because it's well personalized. If you say, why is this? People who were looking at those products, just lay out the whole algorithm, and they were thinking about this camera and wanting to look at that lens, ended up buying this camera. Right? And then they double their profitability in sales. So I think it's a trend that's absolutely very important. And inevitably, you know, it's going to mimic what hap happens offline, where promotions is a bigger business than advertising. The internet's been quite the laggard in catching up to that. And it's sort of a no-brainer that that's going to be the future. I think it's going to be a big trend in the next three years that that happens in commerce. Great. So should we uh, raise our uh, greens or reds? Wow. Ah. Sea of green. Sea now of let's green. do the. Push the buttons. While we're waiting, I might add my just two cents on this. We, we do see the trend more generally about liberating information for you. The president supports a privacy bill of rights that's working its way through Congress now. And we've been talking about in health care, patients are entitled to a copy of their medical data. That's one of the privilege, that's one of the components of our meaningful use program. This morning, I had the pleasure of addressing Connectivity Week. We challenged the industry to provide utility information to consumers. And uh, we see this trend, assessment data to parents. So more information will flow to the individual, and we think that that's actually a very good thing to fuel a number of these concepts. Great. Nice we have a 69 percent. Oh, <laughs> we did. Got a comment up there? Sorry. All right. We have 69% level of agreement on this, uh, and we have 76% uh, of the participants are a six or above. This is the first one that's got a real strong level of support. Great. Okay, okay. trend number well done, five. Kurt. Well done, Kurt. Kurt, Kurt. woohoo! You, you've arrived. <laughs> it had to happen. <laughs> Rosie. At last. We've been waiting a long time for robots to live in and run our homes, like Rosie and the Jetsons household. It's happening a little bit now. Robots are finally starting to leave the manufacturing floor and enter people's homes, offices, and highways. Robots can climb walls, fly, and run. We all know the Roomba for cleaning floors 
And now there's the Vero for your pool. Real-time vision and other sensors and affordable, precise manipulation are enabling robots to assist in our care, drive our cars, and protect our homes and property. We need to broaden our view of what robots and the forms they will take in the future. Think of a self-loading ro robot-compliant dishwasher. The trend is robots becoming embedded in our environments and taking advantage of the cloud to understand and fulfill our needs. Okay, gentlemen. All right. <clears throat> Every, Steve. I'm just writing this down. Green. Steve is the naysayer. Yeah, the one they said, okay. But you blow yeah. up ro robots oh, as a robots. hobby. Right, you know, I just, Steve. you know, really wanting them doesn't make it so. So I, <laughs> I've ridden in the Google. <laughs> I've ridden, I, the one I'm most bullish about actually is the car. So I've ridden the Google car twice now, up and down, Highway 101. It's just an amazing experience. Screeching beyond the capability you ever thought a Prius could, could screech around corners. Um, it's an amazing experience. I absolutely want to buy one. It's just going to be too expensive for the next three years to fulfill this trend. In all the other areas, I think it's wrong. No robots in the home over the next three years. It's absurd. I think the major trend is robots going into the factory. They're not leaving yes. the factory. We don't have nearly enough robots in the factory. Yeah. The first application of humanoid robots will be the factory. That's the place where you have a controlled environment. You have a lot of repetitive tasks still. And there are people like Rodney Brooks who absolutely believe, he's a roboticist from MIT, that these humanoid robots will be cheaper than outsourced labor. They will even be purchased in China for Chinese factories. Okay. That's going to happen before it happens in the home. Okay. So it's just this, this apple kind of train. Robots, yeah. but not You're there. shaking your head in agreement. Actually, no, no, I'm in wild agreement. I, but I support the trend, not literally about where it is in the home, but I think the trend towards robots as co-creators and participants is absolutely part of the National Robotics Initiative. We're going to have a big solicitation on this in R&D. And again, it's one of those areas that we're investing in as a country, and we see great potential for our American competitiveness. Uh, I, I think that you know, robots are here to stay. And I think robots exist in our lives in ways we least expect. I mean, Google is in some ways a software robot that's helping us every single day. And various artificial intelligences <laughs> are essentially software robots of various degrees. And there's some kind of symbiotic existence that we've achieved with these robots already. And that's just getting more and more pervasive. You have, I mean, the, the examples that were given just now by Kurt, you know, sort of the Roomba and other things that people use at home, sort of obvious physical sort of instantiations of the robot idea. But it, it's, you know, I think it's a trend of being helped by friendly sort of automated or semi-automated um, uh, sort of semi-intelligent forms that are getting increasingly more intuitive and intelligent. They're here to stay. They've existed for a while. We've become dependent on them and it's just going to get uh, more and more rich in experience. Mr. Sappho. A key part of what Kurt said here that made me a believer is when he said we need to broaden our view of robots and the forms they will take. And as you just said, this includes software robots. In that sense, it is already rising up. We're not going to have the big, ambitious, exciting robots anytime soon, as, as Steve correctly said but there's still modest but very useful things that are already happening. That said, just outside this time frame, uh, you know, the next big thing, the next big thing, mind-blowing, comes out of nowhere, the general public says, gee, where'd that come from? Like the web or like email and first computer in the 1980s. The next big thing is robots. Uh, it's, it's a couple of years off still, but somewhere out there, someone is working on it, the next Steve Jobs, of robots is there. It's just not three years from now. You heard it here, Paul Sappho. That's why we tape these shows. <laughs> okay, you notice I followed the first rule of forecasting. If you're going to give a prediction, you either give a year or, or a, a prediction, but you don't do both in the same. There you go. Green or red? All right. Ah, interestingly mixed. A bit of okay, let's go to our electronic voting, please. <laughs> a lot of this is about how we define the trend and the debate. In a few more moments on this, and then we're going to show the results. All right, last chance. And here we go. And this one does get over uh, level six. It's right at a six. And as you can see, we do have a, a large majority at six or above, but we still have 18%, giving it a one, two, and a three. 
All right, on to trend number six, social really. The rise of social networks is well documented, but they're not really social networks. They're a mix of friends, strangers, organizations, hucksters. It's more like walking through a rowdy crowd in Times Square at night with a group of friends. There's a growing need for social networks that reflect the fundamental nature of human relationships, known identities, mutual trust, controlled levels of intimacy, and boundaries of shared information. The trend is the rise of true social networks designed to maintain real, respectful relationships online. All right. What? 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 Okay, you change what? your mind. What? Okay. How did this happen? I think I just yeah, have to right. say that. <laughs> <laughs> that. That goes down as obvious. On to trend number seven. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, why isn't it obvious, or why are you such a happy group here? Okay, so I'll disagree with the trend. Um, <laughs> I, I think it, actually, I think this is absolutely right. Um, that the novelty is is off of of the networks. When something is new, we all use it like crazy, and you discover you've got three thousand friends, and you realize it's absurd. You know, it, it's the classic pattern. The idealistic vision of cyberspace ended up becoming suburbia. You know, just a reprise of the boring suburbs that we all live in. Uh, I think what we're going to see actually oh, among some people will not that. only just be a shift to meaningful social networks, but I think there's going to be a vast reaction to the world of Facebook and the like, yeah. where being disconnected is going to be in. Lots of people will sort of sneak onto Facebook when their friends aren't looking, but they won't admit it. And the cool thing will be to not be on LinkedIn and to uh, not be on Facebook. So I think Kurt and his team just nailed this one. <laughs> I'll just make one observation briefly. In healthcare, not to get back on the topic that you all voted down, uh, <laughs> doctors cannot email your medical records to another doctor because of the lack of con confidence in that interface. So in 90 days, you put a little SWAT team on it. We got a secure version of SMTP, authenticate the user on either end and encrypt the message. Now 95% of the market share of providers, of, of, of vendors supporting providers have adopted the protocol and 15 bucks a month unlimited. The point is now we will start to see trusted communications in sectors of the economy that have needed that, and I think that's a trend that will carry on in the professional space and then eventually on. We saw all the cop cars chasing the tornadoes yesterday. I did. They weren't trying to warn people. They were going after the tornado because when it went through the hospital, pulled up all the medical records, <laughs> and it had constituted a meteorological violation of HIPAA regulations. Oh so that, that tornado is so busted. Nice. <laughs> Before we move on, I mean, I think it's important everyone realizes how bad this has gotten, this problem of uh, a sort of you know, ambient intimacy that uh, young people seem to have on Facebook where you make friends with work associates, you know, your drunk friends and others, and share it all in one big mash. It's it actually gotten to remarkable proportions. In the recent survey of American divorce lawyers, 80% of them now use Facebook regularly to make their case. Microsoft did a study recently, and 70% of the time when someone does not get a job and gets rejected, it's because they found something online about them. People just don't realize the privacy violations of not segmenting in a way that we didn't realize in the past we had these barriers, we don't have them today. But there is one counterexample. Okay. Uh, how many people, you know, you notice that Joey Ito just got a job heading the media lab at MIT, and we all went, that's, you know, he's a brilliant guy, but, like, he hasn't ever run anything before. And then we went, oh, of course, he's, he is like, you know, a top-level mage in World of Warcraft. That's true. So, it's true. you know, there are some social networks that really can help you get <laughs> you a can job. Earn credits. <laughs> right. Facebook may be worth a lot of that's money, true. but if you're really good at World of Warcraft, you too can head a world-class research organization. Uh, I think, uh, one uh, uh, Jay, you want to okay. bring sensibility back to this discussion here? Right? Just <laughs> one point. <laughs> I'll try. A uh, simple point I'd like to make is, you know, you have these, the, the network with social, ne the trend with social networks has been sort of increased resolution of the nodes in terms of real identities and more and more real identities getting online. And then secondly, sort of increased functionality that then these nodes can do with each other, whether it's finding the right person to date or paying someone. 
And I would sort of draw people's attention back to something like PayPal, which we had some experience with, uh, where you know, essentially it's one of the earliest social networks that kind of worked because you tried to pay people that you wanted to get something done with. It was a, trust, a semi-trusted transaction that was made more trustworthy by the nature of the network and the technology embedded in it. And I think that kind of thing, which was sort of a one-off build for PayPal's specific functionality, becomes much easier to start building around sort of real identities and networks that we have in places like Facebook. So that's, that's why sort of one, you know, supportive of this trial. Yeah. All right, green or red? Got a love fest going on here. All right, All right. Kurt, 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 Kurt. Okay, electronics, please. And let's see the levels of agreement on this. Vote is almost done. Last chance on this. And here are the results. And this one gets our 80% level of agreement. Very, very high with only 12% saying one through five. All right. All right. Now into augmented reality. With ever cheaper computation and advances in computer vision technology, augmented reality is becoming practical, even in mobile devices. We will move beyond expensive telepresence environments and virtual reality games to fully immersive environments in the office, on the factory floor, in medical care facilities, and in new entertainment venues. I once did an experiment where a person came into a room and sat down at a desk against a large 3D high-definition TV display. The projected image showed a room with a similar desk up against the screen. The person that I brought in would put on 3D glasses, and then a projected person would enter and sit down at the other table. After talking for five or 10 minutes, the projected person would stand up and put their hand up. Most of the time, the person I brought in would stand up and put their hand into the screen. They had quickly adapted and forgotten that the other person was not in the room. Augmented reality will become indistinguishable from reality. The trend is an enchanted world with hyper-resolution augmented reality and hyper-accurate artificial people and objects that fundamentally enhance people's experience of the world. Mm. Wow. I'm two, green. You're green. Okay, two reds two and uh, okay, uh, a niche. Again, my theme this evening is going to be yes on all because I don't prognosticate. <laughs> yes, but I'm here to share what we're trying to do to bring that to reality. So I, I say this not with a prediction but a reality. Uh, we put up recovery.gov data, and entrepreneurs uh, downloaded the uh, open information. They built, I think the guys at Layar or whatever it was, uh, you could actually walk and visually through your iPhone see which projects were funded by the Recovery Act, so you had some transparency. <laughs> uh, people found that interesting. But beyond that, our military uses this very, very productively, and it's very, very successful in training missions. And uh, they're very, very uh, supportive of seeing this capability extend uh, outside of the military. So we're working on a bunch of opportunities to see this further. And again, I think it's, uh, it's proven itself to be effective in key sectors like the military. OK, any other augmented reality fans here? Uh, okay, so I, I could argue. You need an editor, Kurt. Um, I, the sexy part of this, the 3D oh, glasses and you stuff, need an editor. Is, uh, <laughs> is, is not going to happen anytime soon. Um, you know, tele we're going to be stuck with our crummy teleconferencing systems for longer than any of us would wish. Uh, however, as Anish said, it is being used effectively in specialized environments today. But in terms of immersiveness, it's already happened. We call them movies. Uh, look at what Avatar did. Uh, look at what Call of Duty does as a video game. But the place where it's already here, and it's not even a forecast, it's awesome. is it's on, it's on our iPads. How many, just to pick one example, how many people have used Star Walk? This is, so if you have little That's kids you? and they look up at the sky, um, th you should get this app because it'll make you a hero. Um, you, you know, the kid points up at a star and says, Daddy, what's that star? And you have no idea. 
with Starwalk, you hold your iPad up and it automatically orients. And so the star in the sky is the star in the field of view here. As you move, you see the whole sky. It even plays cool hearts of space music. So um, <laughs> it's entertaining and cheap. That's where we're going to see augmented reality expand very quickly is on the devices we already have. That SRI has nailed this. Wow, you got so, a little, that's a fan so, over there. I like that. Uh, he's, I think that's right from Star he owns Wars. that company, yeah. So <laughs> naysayers. I think, you know, uh, just maybe this is a little bit of the Luddite in me, but at the end of the day, the highest uh, resolution or the highest bandwidth interactions you have with people is in person, and it's very, very difficult to replace that. You can replace that with very rich sensations that are simulated, but I think at some level the brain is aware that these are simulations. So taking this proposition at face value, I don't think you're going to see sort of an augmented reality universe of people suspended in 20 by 20 foot rooms sort of playing sort of in living in virtual environments anytime soon, sort of connected to a drip with their nutrients. Um, although that's a Hollywood fantasy that you know, might well come true. So that's really sort of what I'm rebelling against here. And uh, all every, I freely concede what my predecessors on the panel have just said. Right. Steve? Yeah, I, um, I'm actually somewhat persuaded by what Paul said. But as worded and all the focus on 3D glasses, I think that maybe threw me in this idea of either a hyper-real, immersive 3D kind of VR kind of experience. Um, absolutely not, I don't think, in any kind of business or home context in a big way in the next three years. The, right. the lenticular screens that let you do it without glasses are too expensive. You need new hardware. That's going to slow it down. The glasses are well, you know, pain in the cortex you know, after any extended use. So I just don't see that happening. The idea of the overlay is really cool. And there are a number of different places where that, which doesn't really speak to this trend, but that kind of way of augmenting reality is interesting, but probably not in the top 10 list of markets or opportunities for the next three years. Just, oh. I'm sorry, I was just going to say, there are some immediate applications to Anisha's point, especially in the military situation or disaster relief situation. One of our companies, Palantir Technologies, you know, oh, developed. Oh, I love those guys. Yeah, I mean, they've done fantastic work with augmented reality. They sort of, they had hack week in one week. They basically developed an application where you're a company commander, you've just been dropped in Afghanistan, you, you sort of turn on your iPhone. This is not complex technology, and you're able to look down the road. You know where the IED explosions happen. You know where you know, former supply depots of the Taliban are located. Things that you know, your predecessor might just forget to tell you in their haste to leave in some cases. Um, so it, it's happening, and uh, it's actually saving lives. Uh, in defense of Kurt, just before you vote, I mean, where the, his description goes wrong is, is assuming that we need the sexy technology to have you know, enchanted worlds and compelling experiences. We all know we're from Silicon Valley. You don't need high tech for compelling experience. Compelling experience comes from matching the technology to the application. A hundred years ago, people put flickering lights against a wall and it made people laugh and cry. It was called movies. And so you don't need a technological deus ex machina to make this trend real. You can do it with our smart devices that are here today. All right, let's move to the greens and the reds <laughs> cards. All right. Very interesting. Wow. That's pretty even. Pretty even. I try. Uh, let's to. verify that electronically. And we're almost there. Last chance on this one, we'll see the level of agreement with this trend. And here we go. And so this gets a 58% level of agreement. It's spread across the board. Uh, this is one of the more uh, diverse votes that we've had. It's pretty much not quite down the middle. 58% level of agreement. Great. Great. All right, on to trend number eight. Engineering by biologists. Biologists and engineers are different kinds of people, unless they're working on synthetic biology. We know about genetically engineered food and creatures, such as goldfish in multiple colors. Next, we'll have biologically engineered circuits and devices. Evolution has created adaptive processing and system resiliency that is much more advanced than anything we've been able to design. We are learning how to tap into that natural expertise designing devices using the mechanisms of biology. 
We have already seen simple biological circuits in the laboratory. The trend is practical engineered artifacts, devices, and computers based on biology rather than just silicon. Okay, gentlemen. Yeah, I think we've had this trend every year, and I think it was Jervy that came up with it every year, right? Uh, now you're only half baked. Well, it's well, just actually, been so mangled. I, I, uh, oh, curtain it's hard to define this. Okay, unmangle it. Well, so I, it's the computers. I mean, oh, God, there's so much potential as he starts, right? The big trend over the next three years is going to be biomimicry, learning from nature, building complex systems by using biological processes to evolve code instead of engineering it. But we're not going to engineer artifacts and computers using this anytime in the next three years. We're going to build fuels and chemicals, materials, monolayers, things like that. Those are the baby steps for the next right. five to ten years. Circuits and computers are out 20 years, and it'll start with memory because those are repeated arrays of the same stuff and solar cells and, um, you know, CCDs or sensors where you can do self-assembly. But things like a logic chip or a full-on computer, that's a long way off because the heterogeneity of the, of the interface. You can't do wiring at that scale using biological processes. So, you know, what nature does very well is work in a 3D fluid medium. It does very poorly on two-dimensional flat surfaces. So there are some opportunities at that interface, but in the near term, the trillion dollar business is to get off the petrochemical economy, re-engineer microbes like algae and bacteria to make interesting fuels and chemicals out of other waste feedstock streams and CO2 out of the air. That's the big opportunity and computers is just a pipe dream for 10, 15 years. I, I agree with Steve. Okay. I voted this trend down out of love. Uh, <laughs> out of love. <laughs> simply, simply to say this is a trend that needs a lot more love from people in this room and from, the, from Silicon Valley in general. Uh, you know, this is a tremendously underinvested uh, vector, and it's fundamentally going to change the world. We look at several companies in this space, and in most cases, you know, you want to give them nonprofit grants. They're not commercially viable, certainly not in a three-year time frame. But uh, I wish they were, and I can't is wait until they isn't are. Isn't part of the problem that you know this takes biological scientists, and we're a bunch of computer scientists? I mean, that is it an opportunity? Yeah, absolutely. Paul, uh, you know, again. You can listen to this and, and draw two conclusions. The question is whether the trend is underway, not whether the trend is complete. Correct. And the trend is clearly underway. I mean, just last week, you know, Craig Venter and his team um, made their big announcement of, you know, uh, we've got our first synthetic cell. You know, they engineered a completely synthetic um, virus, um, uh, a bacterium genome from scratch and dropped it into a cell. You know, so we are we are doing starting to do this stuff now. It hasn't played out commercially, but let me offer a warning. To, how many people here are double E's or engineers? Raise your hands. Okay, about every 30 years, the science field turns into technology and becomes the basis of new industrial empires. And you can always, you know, at the 1900 it was chemistry, the middle of the century it was physics, then we had electronics. The sure sign that electronics is over is this. You can always tell what's hot because if you're a single guy at a cocktail party and some cute young thing says, oh, what do you do? And you say, I am a fill in the blank. If they're impressed, that means it's the field of the future. These days saying I'm a software engineer will not get you a date. On the other hand, did it, did it ever say, though, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> yes, briefly, in the oh, mid 1990s. I was English literature. <laughs> I got all sorts of dates. Look at look but at my wife. She's beautiful. Me, if today you say I'm in genomics or genetics, it will get you a date. Uh, the trend is happening. <laughs> All right. Lifting Anish. up for a moment, let me lift. Anish, um, what's your degree in there? One of the uh, public policy at the Kennedy uh, School. Oh, no Very dates. Big winners, big winners. <laughs> I, you uh, married the first girl that said yes. <laughs> Touche. I will say this. Uh, one of the most exciting events that I've had in the tenure I've been in uh, Washington, uh, the co-chairs of our innovation committee for the president are Eric Schmidt and Shirley Ann Jackson. They convened the top 35 researchers, uh, you know, under the under 35 researchers, and we had a number of them come to watch. It's all on YouTube. The power is what's happening at the intersection of bio, info, and nano, and that that triumvirate is an area of emphasis. Maybe you call it the nonprofit sector. We're putting a lot of R&D behind it. Yeah. But to listen to these folks, and you can watch the video 
from our June meeting last year. It is just an inspiration to hear what they're doing. Very exciting. Cool. All right, green or red? Slow voting on this. One. That's more green than There's more a lot green of no, on this no than the health IT. Come oh, on. Hey. Okay. Electronic Incredible. voting, please. Just, yeah. Very low. Yeah, low turnout. That looks more red than green. Incredible. That was a low voter turnout on that. People are like, ah, we'll find no, out. Hard. Is it more red or green? And we are almost at our vote total here. Last chance to vote. And here are the results. And this is uh, right in the middle, 51%, right in the middle. That was a good one. So very split, almost evenly. That is our closest bell curve that we've had yet. All right, trend number nine. Cyber attacks are ever more frequent and effective. Most attacks exploit holes that are inevitable given the complexity of the software products we use every day. Cyber researchers, on the other hand, really understand this. To avoid these vulnerabilities, some cyber researchers are beginning to use only simple infrastructure and applications that are throwbacks to the computing world of two decades ago. As simplicity is shown to be an effective approach for avoiding attack, it will become the guiding principle of software design. The trend is cyber defense through widespread adoption of simple, low-feature software for consumers and businesses. Gentlemen? Red, red, half, half. I'm going to just vote green out of sympathy, but I can't. Well. <laughs> Is that green or half and half? Yeah, that's great. I'm going to go no, green. No, no, the end. Me, I'm half. half. I, I'm wow. not voting no tonight. That's like a no for, for okay. But I'm trying to be respectful. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Okay. All right. Does so anybody have a strong opinion? As, as the sole green, let me critique it. This is this is so misses the point. Um, <laughs> and then first of green. all, throwbacks <laughs> throwbacks to the simplicity of software two decades ago. Forgive me, but that would be Windows uh, 90, you know, and and Word. Um, you know, all I can say is Windows is really great when there's cyber attacks because. When it goes down, you don't notice because it's <laughs> performing just as bad as always. But I think they're Whoa. right about one thing. I mean, it's not a throwback to the past. It's a move into the future. What this is really acknowledging, nobody, nobody's going to design software um, experiences based on cyber attacks because nobody will buy it for that reason. But what it nicely matches is the app world. We're already yes. doing this in the app world, which is, atomizing out into small, simple apps. And uh, if the uh, you know, cyber protection uh, engineers would like to follow that pattern, I think that's, that's fine. So that's why I vote. Ajay. Uh, you know, I want complex, high-performing <coughs> software with simple interfaces that are intuitive to use. It's as simple as that. It has, I don't want simple software. I want simple to use software. Those are two Amen. very different things. Amen. And I think what this trend fails to capture, with due respect to, to our colleagues at SRI, is you know, people have to be conscious users of information. And the simple software, if you will, that is actually very complex, that's existed for over two or three decades that could help with this is encryption. And if users would become more intelligent about and more aware about how they use their own data and manipulate it online, especially as they migrate to the cloud, uh, we would have a lot fewer accidents. I mean, the attacks will happen. Windows will be Windows. Um, and it just will matter a lot less to us. Um, so that's what I look forward to. I'd add this to the category of trends that's not only wrong, but, but, but inversely correct, meaning not only do people not want simple software, which is obvious, and simplicity is not the same as simple software. It takes a very complex piece of code to present a simple experience, so it's they're unrelated. In fact, going to simple software and that trend, that thought, the lessons learned from the internet around there is actually leading to a lot of the current malware attacks. But what do I mean by this? If you have uh, open code, sure, that's a good way to protect against attacks. If you have heterogeneity of code, sure, that's a great way to prevent attacks, but the simplicity of the transport pipes, which is like the HTTP protocol winning out over Gopher and FTP and everything else that was out there, sort of the simplest of protocols won, and some people thought by lesson that's sort of an unhackable, very secure way to do computing, that that's a good thing for all code, that's the mistake. Because we have dumb pipes that are simple, we have a very rich presentation layer, the browsers, HTML5, the scripting languages that are the UI for the individual are incredibly complex. 
And there you get this blending of content and code in the scripts that is the primary vehicle for malware today. So again, to recap the statement, we had a simple pipes, bad to learn a lesson because we had to push intelligence to the edge, and that is where all the vulnerability is, is currently centered. So I think the era of building software that any one human can understand is rapidly disappearing. No one person understands Windows, right? It is way beyond the capacity of any human being to understand. It, we can't go back to simple code. We have to go back to methodologies like open source and heterogeneity of code to give us some degree of protection. I'll just make one comment. This is obviously a great area of interest to the country, to the president. We put legislation forward last week uh, to talk about cybersecurity. My responsibilities in this area to think about the R&D questions and plans. And I am much more interested in fault tolerance and how we mitigate against attack than preventing. So we have all the ammunition in the world to identify signatures and block, and the race is on. They just keep coming in. Uh, to the extent that there's innovation taking place that's exciting, it's identifying those things that can come in but have minimal effect on the system because we're more fault tolerant. We can move the, uh, move the target and the defense. So I'm, I'm keen for more of what was described earlier in terms of uh, simplicity in its UI, not in the underlying design. All righty. With that, let's see the green and red cards, please. And then uh, <laughs> looks uh, very red. Uh, right. Let's move to the electronic voting, please. That looked like voting in Havana. <laughs> <laughs> We are almost there to show the votes. And here are the results. And we've got our lowest one so far, 2.9. And really strong values at 1, 2, and 3. But again, we have 7% of our participants giving an 8, 9, and a 10. Oh All right. Wow. All right. Now on to trend 10, our last one of the evening. Take it away, Kurt. Mobile communication is proliferating at an astonishing rate in developing countries as price points drop and wireless infrastructure improves. As developing countries leapfrog the need for physical infrastructure and brokers, using mobile apps to conduct micro-scale businesses and to improve quality of life, they are innovating new applications. The developing world is quickly becoming the largest market we've ever seen for mobile computing and much, much more. The trend is for de developing countries to turn around the flow of innovation. Silicon Valley will begin to learn more from them about innovative applications than they need to learn from us about the underlying technology. Wow, this is, this is heavy duty. Can't wait to see how you guys vote. Vote green, three greens and a red. We'll start with uh, Ajay. The red is very simply because I think Globalization is about enhancing conversation across the board, including among innovators no matter where they live. And Silicon Valley is sort of the sort of cultural code for that way of thinking, living, and being. And essentially what this says to me is um, the great fruit of globalization for those of us in this room and living in this part of the world is we're going to be able to see underlying trends, opportunities, markets in real time and actually not only see those markets, but also see the great innovators working in those markets and work closely with them, and vice versa. And I continue to believe some of the most interesting, intensive innovations that fundamentally change the world will continue to ha you know, happen here. We see this, I, I would challenge any investor in this room, the companies we see, the inventors that we see, the innovators we see, come from all over the world. They come here. So there is something about the, 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 the culture that makes this work. but the catchment area just became the world, and that's amazing and awesome. So. Yeah, let me, let me just pick up on this. The, the, the last phrasing of the sentence was what made it a bit more of a tougher call to make because it was not what, uh, Kurt, I'd push back on the, mm -hmm. this is not about us being less effective in leading this charge. I just see the potential. President was visiting India, I had the pleasure of joining him, and uh, he had the experience to communicate with a, a village that had no indoor plumbing and had no infrastructure, but had 4G WiMAX and had fiber to the panchayat. And he communicated with that village, and they described for him in three months what's happened as they've been powered up in the new capacity. Unbelievable stories about uh, how they've been able to liberate some of their experiences. And uh, the president literally said that he's witnessing this leapfrogging of what's happening. They didn't have any infrastructure at all, and they're looking at how they might deliver education differently, healthcare, and so forth. 
And so it's an exciting opportunity for American innovators to bring our creativity and entrepreneurial spirit to solving the big problems around the world. That is an exciting problem for Americans to engage in and solve. It just is an exciting one to see us building the products and services around the world and then finding ways to bring some of those ideas back and allowing us to think differently. Look, let's talk about education technologies for just a quick second. Somewhere on this planet, someone's going to be inventing a capability that's largely digital in nature that would allow kids to learn algebra, perhaps without the infrastructure that we have in the United States system. Will the United States be the supplier of the, is, just, you're right, people are commenting about what's there now. I visited the Khan Academy visit in Los Altos today. Look, will the American economy produce those products and services and export them around the world? I'm betting on that future, but they'll be serving those markets first. I met all these entrepreneurs in learning technologies. Their first dollar of revenue is exports because they can sell to those global markets before they can sell to the K-12 system in the U.S. So that's where I see. I just push back on the, we won't be the guys inventing this stuff. I think we will, but it'll be a very exciting time to watch. By the oh. way, I, I okay. put sure. my hand up when you mentioned teaching algebra with new digital technology. We, we have done that. And I think it's one of the most exciting things we've ever done because you know as well as anybody um, what we're doing to our kids um, right now is just horrible. In Detroit, less than 25% of the boys graduate from high school. If an enemy did this to us, we'd go to war. And we're doing it to ourselves. If there's an important problem in America, that has to be one that's the top of the list. Amen. Yeah, yeah. bring it. Now uh, to the down note, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> How did I get this reputation? No, I mean, this isn't a trend that already happened. I mean, it's China, it's India, you know, what happened in India in the 1990s. Uh, this is what happened. Uh, and in, in the negative forms, we call it things like offshoring. Um, and, uh, and in the really negative forms, you know, a hotbed, you know, where's a hotbed of software innovation that we hate? Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, those folks are going to eventually move from you know, the, the criminal side to the innovation side. Uh, and a wild card here is the coming uh, youth bulge in, in Africa. So this isn't a trend, it's already afoot. Um, and we already learned lots from abroad. Silicon Valley used to be the only place where significant innovation happened. Today, it is a node on a global network and Silicon Valley works precisely because we are already listening very carefully to the rest of the world. You know, I mean, back in the 90s, we had the largest multiplex in California open over here in Fremont, and all it showed were Indian Masala movies. You know, it wasn't because a bunch of uh, native-born Californians decided that they liked Masala movies. Silicon Valley already does this. It's going to increase. Steve? Yeah, yeah, I think the, the important takeaway, and since we're wrapping up with this, is that the, the Uber trend of globalization isn't going to reverse itself, right? The markets and the opportunities overseas are enormous. And so this is an opportunity for Silicon Valley entrepreneurs building platforms, building systems to understand, and as this trend says, learn from those markets. Figure out how when you have deep mobile penetration like in Korea and China and India, and you have new mobile payment systems, what does the future look like? In fact, at the application layer, in many cases, these developing countries are painting the future. My parents and I uh, trace our history to Estonia, and for many years, Nokia across the pond would do their market research in Estonia because the penetration rate there was so much higher of mobile telephony. And so they would see applications like paying for the you know, parking system long before it was available elsewhere. For years now, they voted using the cell phone, right? They vote for president with the cell phone over there. You know, we'll get there one day here. And the CTO, I'm sure, is working on that. <laughs> the security <laughs> systems, you know, the cybersecurity that's required to pull that is non-trivial. The, the cutting edge, especially on mobility, is elsewhere, right? If you want to do massive multiplayer games, you look to Korea. You don't look to New York, yep. right? 2004 in Korea. That's right. That was, you know, we didn't get around to it till Zynga, you know. I mean, one, one very, uh, just one minor point to add to this, it's one very useful way we've had to think about this internally, and, you know, my colleague Peter Thiel has talked about this as well publicly, is sort of innovation is intensive versus extensive. The idea that intensive innovation is focusing hard on complex problems and taking something from zero to one. And one is a state, one can be a larger quantity, a smaller quantity. And extensive is sort of going from one to n, 
And you can define n in all sorts of ways. You, you know, it's sort of you're replicating something in iterative, interesting ways. And n can be demographics, n can be new geogra you know, geographical sort of markets. Uh, you can think of it in all sorts of interesting ways. But sort of the zero to one is, I think, what we're really talking about here. And that's America's you know, principal competitive advantage. And I still think we're a beacon to the world in doing that well. And we'll be better at it because of these technologies. Yeah, and I, I would just like to add, as a person that grew up here, is this zero to one phenomenon happened many, you know, ways, whether it was the summer of love and rock and roll and, you know, LSD and, you know, the HP way, you know. Uh, so I, I would very much echo that we're going to be the zero one uh, player for many years to come. But we're not going to be the only zero one player. Well, no, that's true. Yet to be seen. So with that, because uh, we've got to let you all get home to your families, let's raise our red and green cards here. Okay. It's going out. looks like on a high note. Kurt, let's transfer to the electronic voting. And here is the results for trend number 10. And we get a 71% level of agreement. This is one right. of our higher ones for All the right. night. Yes. Wow. So this one's pretty strong. Hey. Oh. <laughs> and, and then we are going to show you the overall trends compared amongst yeah, themselves. And here they are. So the highest one. Tony, if you want to review this. Mm -hmm. No, go ahead. Trend six, social, really, with an 80% level. And then the second highest one was trend 10, reverse innovation. Wow. And then the next three that all got over 50% levels of agreement, Pay Me Now, Trend 4, Rosie at last, Trend 5, and then the last one that got over 50% was In Your Face Augmented Reality, and then the ones that we did not have 50% uh, or more agreement on are the remainders, and that is Trend 8, Engineering by Biologists. We had a lot of diversity on these four. We were really split. So Made For Me, which was Trend 3, Age Before Beauty, the first one, and then the doctor is in, but we did have a lot of agreement on trend nine as well, that uh, tis a gift to be simple. There's unanimity that that did not see support. But these are the ones right here where we would have some conversations on those four. Um, and interestingly, the panelists voted a little differently, Tony, than everyone else. <laughs> they did. This is the vote of the panelists right uh -huh. here. So for the panelists, the highest ones were trend six, social really like everyone else, but the second one for them was rosy at last. So the panelists, as a group felt that one really stood out. And then also what stood out from the rest of the group was trend three, the made for me. That was very different than the overall group. And overall, the panelists had more trends that they voted 50% or higher on in terms of saying, yes, that is a trend. All righty. So <laughs> you guys aren't hey, influential. Thanks for hearing us out. Okay, I think we all, you know, Kurt was on the hot seat here, and I think he did a terrific yeah, job this Kurt. year. So let's get it. Good job. You know, uh, I grew up going to high school across from SRI and always appreciate all the smart people that <laughs> drove into the parking lot over there. And it's <laughs> nice to see you there, uh, the rest of you. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Anish. It's God bless you. Uh, keep coming back to Silicon Valley. We yes, need you. Uh, Paul, my yeah, buddy. Uh, Ajay, thank you for coming for your first time. I think it didn't go too bad. Hopefully, we'll have you back. Paul, you're you're always entertaining. We love you. We don't know if you will be invited back, but we'll talk about that with the steering committee after. And then, of course, uh, our all-timer, Steve Germanson. Yeah. Okay, with that, I believe Steve is going to come back uh, as the president. Here we go. And he's going to do the closing remarks. But thank you very much. I love coming back. It's always great to be here. No church report. Thanks, Tony. And thanks again, everyone, for coming tonight. I hope you learned something and had a great time. Thanks to all our speakers, Steve, Ajay, Paul, and Anish, and thanks for our trend presenter, Kurt, and SRI. And thanks again, once, uh, once again, to Tony for being our impresario for the 13th time tonight. Wow. For each of you, we have a brand new, not used, Churchill Club t-shirt as a token Excellent. of our appreciation. <laughs> Is that under the gift roll? Yeah. yeah.
Where are these in good health? Right. Thanks, right. thanks again to our sponsors. Okay. Oh, we got all stand up. And, okay. Thanks again to our sponsors, Cisco, Deloitte, and SRI International. You've been a great audience. Thanks for coming. Have a good night. See you next year.